welcome to one more wonderful session for uh, Let, Let's Learn Surgery. Uh, we are much more focused on uh, how youngsters can pick up a career in surgery and we have selected topics that will help you become good surgeons. And uh, this is the core principle of Let's Learn Surgery. And for today's topic, opportunities uh, for Indian surgeons in UK. So surgical training in the United Kingdom, an Indian perspective. To present this, we have Dr. Karthik Mardachalam. Uh, Dr. Karthik Mardachalam is currently uh, the consultant GI surgeon at Miyot International Hospital. He specializes in upper GI bariatric and is an advanced laparoscopic surgeon. Um, and uh, he trained, he did his MBBS from Kilpock Medical College and completed in 1996. He did his MS subsequently from the same medical college and went on to finish his intercollege at FRCS Edinburgh in general surgery in 2011. And uh, he completed the CCT in 2012. Um, a man with immense skills and is always a BCB operating uh, day in and day out in both emergencies and elective surgeries. Uh, a, his CV runs into long pages with multiple presentations and a superb training program. So we thought he's the right person to actually interact with youngsters and to present the way in which they can go through a UK uh, training program and enhance their skills. Um, to moderate the session, we have Dr. Kanagwil. Dr. Kanagwil is currently the president of the Chennai chapter of ASI, extremely well um, connected person with regard to surgeons, helping out a lot of youngsters. Dr. Kanagwil and um, GI surgery had a long association. He was with Dr. Professor Chandra Mohan for a long time and uh, a friend in need in most uh, circumstances. Kanagwil has uh, become a part of almost all the academic programs in surgery in India. So we welcome both of you. Uh, is, for, for this nobody session. can be more humble than him. Yeah. And is is universally liked by all the across universally the loved by all the yeah. of India. So so we are so happy to have both of you here, and okay. uh, and the session is handed over to both of you too. Thank you. Pleasure okay. uh, being in this platform. Thank you, Radha sir, and thank you, Lango sir. Uh, Karthik sir, I think uh, we'll go ahead with your talk. Then we can have questions and sure. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ilango, and uh, thank you, Dr. Patala Krishna, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kanagwe, for giving me this opportunity to sort of uh, present. Um, basically, you know, I will start my presentation by um, sort of talking through what the, exactly the opportunities are for surgical training in the United Kingdom. Uh, <clears throat> I feel that uh, because I, I sort of did my MS general surgery here, and then went on to do training in the UK. I've seen both sides of the spectrum, you know. Um, so uh, why should we train in the United Kingdom? Should, uh, because now India has got a lot of good training programs and uh, there are some, some exemplary institutes as well. So uh, both uh, government institutions and private institutions that are offering a wide variety of training, uh, not only sort of training in general surgery, but in, uh, you know, subspecialty training, super specialty training. So uh, why should a surgical candidate think of training in the United Kingdom? For one, uh, most training in the United Kingdom has a structured training program. That means that, what do you mean by a structured training program? That, that means that, you know, you, if you do a year, you are expected to achieve this, these proficiencies. That means just like at the end of your first year of MS, you should be able to do your hernia. Just very similar, you are set some goals, you know. And uh, uh, it is not only the responsibility of the trainee to achieve those goals, it is also the responsibility of the trainer to make sure that the trainee is able to achieve these goals. Okay. So that's one of the reasons. So in India, uh, you do get a lot of good training opportunities, but there are, you know, there are, you know, the patches of areas where you may not be able to get the, you know, the uh, sufficient number of training that is necessary to make you feel confident as a surgeon. Apart from that, you can go for fellowship programs in the United Kingdom. That means that you can get a concentrated amount of training done in a short period of time. So suppose you want to become a, you know, you want to do some, uh, uh, you want to become a transplant surgeon or you want to do advanced laparoscopic surgery. You can go and do a six months or a year 
Uh, and there is a wide variety of specialty training available. So this is not just about uh, general surgery training. You can do you know, training in orthopedics, you can do training in urology, you can do training in ENT. So uh, it's a wide variety of specialty training available. And there is an opportunity to appear for the FRC examination. Uh, but, you know, uh, so for a lot of us, well, you know, we had at least uh, in when I was uh, qualifying to become an MS, we, you know, we are not the ambitions for us to, us to appear, was, appear for the FRC examination and be able to pass it. Uh, so it gives you an opportunity to do that. And the other thing is to work in the NHS, you know, having worked both because I worked in India, this is a uh, working in Miot now is the, my first uh, sort of experience of working in a private sector anywhere in the world. I've never worked in the private sector in the world. And I've always worked in public hospitals because, you know, I trained in Chennai. I worked in private hospital for three years when I did my MS. So that was a government hospital. And then the NHS is basically a public health care system. It's not, it's not a privatized system. So because, you know, there is no... Uh, uh, there's no instance of where the patient has to pay for his or her care. So that's one of the best systems in the world. The reason for that is if you step into a hospital, you can actually demand quality care. You know, that, that does not happen anywhere in the world. So that is something I think in India we should aspire to. You know, but having uh, that is difficult because uh, one, you know, the scope of this uh, discussion but working in the NHS just gives you a perception of how good public health care should be or could be. It also helps to expand your horizons. You know, if you train in the UK, obviously you get a you know, feel for different cultures. The UK is a complete melting point, melting pot, where uh, uh, people from various different cultures come. You, know, you can interact with various, you can see the world. You, know, you, you, can, you can interact with people from uh, you know, Iceland, Canada, Japan. You, know, you, you would never think that we, you would meet all these people. Whereas, uh, if you're an Indian, obviously your you know your uh, exposure to this the, these kind of opportunities and to this kind of experiences is limited. So to if what for so the basic uh, aspect of if you want to train in the UK, whether you want to train as a surgical uh, specialist or whether you want to do medicine or anesthesia or whatever, you need to have a certain amount of proficiency in English. That means. You should be able to pass the international English language testing score with a score of seven in each testing area and an overall score of 7.5. Now, this is now not being replaced by the OET, but you can also do the OET, which is an occupational English test. That gives you a little bit of advantage in the sense that most of it is a medicine version. That means the questions will be based on sometimes on actual clinical scenarios or you know, you'll have, they'll give you a history and you'll have to read about it and then answer it. And you have to be achieve a grade B. So this is a, a basic sort of, you know, uh, uh, exam which you have to pass if you want to practice as a doctor in the United Kingdom. And if you want to apply for GMC registration, which is General Medical Council registration in the UK, then you'll have to pass these tests within two years before you think of applying. So... What, what are the routes of entry if, you know, as a surgeon, what would be or all the routes of entry? Now, I actually went through the PLAP, you know, which is the uh, Professional Linguistic Assessment Board, which uh, is still being conducted. You know, the PLAP, I would say, is not for someone who has uh, done a lot of surgery and then decides to go to the UK because, you know, it is mainly based on a lot of internal medicine. There is some surgery, but very minimal surgery is involved in that. So it will be suitable. It will be suitable for someone who is maybe in their first year of training, first year of MS, or first year of DNB in general surgery, who's still fresh out of college, who has you know reasonable good knowledge of internal medicine to be able to sit for this exam. Okay, why should you do the PLAB? Why not just do the MRCS? You know, yes, you can do the MRCS, but if you do the PLAB, you know, if you're uh, if you're someone who is just done your general surgery and you're still thinking, oh, maybe you know, I should attend anesthesia then yes, then you'll be able to switch if you want to, you know. But if you're a surgeon and if you just want to do surgery, then the following exams, passing the following exams will help you. So uh, uh, if you, you know, passing the MRCS, so the MRCS is basically an entry exam. That means it is a common exam for a lot of core surgical specialties. So the core surgical specialties that we are interested about is general surgery um, and then ENT, orthopedics and neurosurgery. Okay, so this is where the core specialty exam. So then 
So the MRCS exam can contain questions from either of these specialties. So it's not a, a specialty focused exam. It is basically a general, a general exam which gives you entry into surgical training. Okay. So why should it, why do you need to pass these exams? The reason you need to pass these exams is because the GMC has got certain criteria which you need to fulfill. So passing the plan or the MRCS so it means that you fulfill the criteria for GMC registration. Now, the, the F, now there's also an exam called the FRCS International. The FRCS International is now uh, aimed at the level of uh, uh, surgeons who have, you know, a, a completed uh, a course of training. So either an MS or a DNB in general surgery, or sometimes the MCH, because the FRCS, the FRCS International exam is uh, other is called the FRCS exit exam in the United Kingdom. That means that you do this exam once you are close to finishing the training, registrar training in the United Kingdom. That means you should be ready as a consultant. So this exam is aimed at people who are at a level that will be able to work as a first year consultant in the NHS in the UK. Okay. So the FRCS international exam is a little bit higher. So for someone who's freshly finished their MS, I would say go for their MRCs. Or who has, you know, who's done the MCH or has worked as a consultant or done the MS, or worked as a consultant for five or six years, then the FRCs international exam will be a better option, okay. It is also useful for people who want to get a UK degree, but don't want to, you know, practice in the UK. You know, if you want to go to the Gulf, uh, so you want to have an additional degree, you know, which will give you, uh, you know, a better, either a better option or a better salary, then yes, you can go for the FRC international exam. The other route of entry where you did not want to do an exam, it was called the overseas doctor's training scheme. Okay. So that meant that the, for the overseas doctor's training scheme, two consultants have to sign you off. Uh, one consultant from India saying that you've got the necessary qualifications and the necessary uh, expertise and clinical knowledge to be were able to work as a surgical registrar in the United Kingdom and someone from the United Kingdom being able to do the same for you. Now, this has been replaced by the International Postgraduate Degree, sorry, Deanery, uh, which is run by the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. Uh, I, you know, I'm a surgical tutor for the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and I'll be able to explain to you a bit more in detail about that. So, <laughs> now, uh, well, core surgical training. Core surgical training in the UK is basically for people who have done their MBBS. Sometimes it, you know, you can do it as an MS, but nowadays they are, you know, now the core surgical training is getting concentrated. So for people who have done their MS, this is a, a little more, what to say, this may be a, a little bit more uh, um, senior to get into in the sense that you may have done enough work as a surgeon to, for you to start post surgical training, you may not find this very useful. But for someone who has done an MBBS and wants to become a surgeon in the UK and has done maybe just a year of, you know, like a, uh, like an, you know, in surgery or in surgical gastroenterology, you just want to start their surgical training. Post surgical training is very, very useful. Now, what do you mean by post surgical training? That means that you may be, you may need to do a uh, certain amount of two years of training in uh, the core specialties that I told you about in either general surgery or in ENT, orthopedics, and sometimes in pediatric surgery or in neurosurgery. Why do you need to do core surgical training? The reason you need to do core surgical training is it gives you a broad you know, view of surgical training. So you, you are allowed, you're, you're exposed to different surgical specialties because there may be people who are not sure of what they want to do. You know, there may be people like, Initially, when I started training in the UK, I was not sure whether I wanted to do urology or whether I wanted to stay in surgical gastroenterology. So I spent a year in urology and found that I did not like it. So I moved on to surgical gastroenterology. Now, that sort of, uh, 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 what to say, flexibility is unfortunately a bit difficult in India because if you, if you're, you know, if you're done your MS general surgery and then you find you don't like it, you want to move to orthopedics. It's quite difficult to move because you know you have you entered training and the train and the getting into training is so complicated in India. It's much more complicated than in the UK, I would say. So uh, you cannot move out of this. So that is why core surgical training is is good because it gives trainees an opportunity to be able to choose what specialty, what surgical specialty they want to. But it also prepares them for 
what we call as higher surgical training. So uh, once you're done your core surgical training, you're expected to pass the MRCS in order to progress to higher surgical training. So higher surgical training, uh, the uh, uh, you know for to qualify for someone. So, so if someone in India wants to uh, get into higher surgical training, because that's what most people from India would be aiming for. They they want to get into higher surgical training where they want to get good you know surgical training for three or four years or maybe four or five years and come try and complete their MRCS and their CCT. So what are the requirements for them? So one you should be you know you should have uh, competencies that are yeah, in line with GMC standards. That means that you should be, you should have a record of your training. So if you've done your MS, you need to have a logbook, okay, and you need to have some amount of what uh, what you call has proficiency signed off by your trainer. So you know because there in the UK, in you every six months you're assessed something by something called an ARCP. That means it's an assessment of your training program assessment where. You, you know, the uh, trainer and the trainees together and discuss about what are the core training or what are the um, training opportunities that are available and also what the trainee has achieved during those six months of training. Okay. In addition, you should be eligible to work in the UK. Now, eligibility to work in the UK is, uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, done through a visa. So that is a different topic altogether because that is something that uh, you know you have to discuss with uh, it's quite easy to find on the internet why you know what are the what is the uh, criteria that you need for to get a visa to work in the uk so the so for someone who has done their ms general surgery and want to move into sort of uh, higher surgical training so this is where uh, this is where you need to move into so you know because Core surgical training is not for people who have done MS general surgery. Because now, previously, the if you can look at the screen, it says the desirable criteria. If you look at it, it says less than 72 months experience in general surgery at CT or ST level. So CT or ST level is equivalent to that of an MS. Uh, I wouldn't say it's equivalent to that of an MCH because you know the MCH is obviously a little bit higher. But then for someone who's done an MS or an MCH, if you want to get into higher surgical training, now if you look at this carefully, it says essential criteria and desirable criteria. Okay. So that means it does not mean that someone who's done an MCH or an, and an MS together will be automatically discounted and will not be allowed to get into training. It just means it depends on the competition. So if, if you've got a, a core set of people who have done, you know, maybe uh, 36 months of training and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you yeah, and you're among the core set and you've maybe done more than six years of training and you want to get into the higher surgical training, then you may be at, be at a slight disadvantage. But that does not mean you'll not be able to get into it. It all depends on your interview performance because you have to understand that all these training posts are goes into what we call as general competition. That means that the uh, what we call the deanery will announce a set of training posts. They'll say, okay, for this year, uh, we have about 20 training posts available, okay? The good thing about the uh, training at the NHS is everyone is allowed to apply, okay? You can apply as long as you meet this, at least the essential criteria. It's not necessary that you should meet the desirable criteria. You just need to meet the essential criteria. If you meet the essential criteria, then you're eligible to apply. And if you put in an application and you get what is called a shortlisted, that means that you are you are sort of suitable to be appointed to the post, okay? If you get shortlisted, it means that you can be appointed to the post. Otherwise, you'll not get shortlisted. So once you get shortlisted for an interview, it means that you have a chance. Now the interview is a competitive interview. That means if someone is interviewed along with me and if I perform poorly, then I don't get the job. You know, I might have desirable criteria, but on that day, if I perform poorly, I don't get the job, you know? So it is very simple as that. So so that does not mean because you don't have desirable criteria, you will not get the job. It means that if you have desirable criteria, you are slightly at an it is slightly at an edge compared to other competitors, but it does not mean you're discounted. It just that if you have more than 72 months experience, you got to justify it. You got to say why you spend such a long time in training. And you also, if you're able to justify that, they'll accept that and they'll, you know, they'll appoint you. 
So why do you need to do higher surgical training? Now, higher surgical training usually starts from what we call as ST3. That means, you know, specialty training three. And it goes on up to ST6, or seven or eight, uh, that either four or five years, depending on the specialty that you're doing. And it's a period of concentrated training. Uh, so if you're doing a general surgical training, you will be what the, the first three years or first four years will be spent in a lot of allied specialties. Well, so, so you might do upper GI six months, lower GI six months, you might do breast. Uh, previously, vascular was in the training, but now vascular is out, out of the training program. It's, they've got a separate training program. Uh, you may do habitability for six months. You may do transplant for six months. Again, they're giving you a choice just to go through, you know, what, what specialist you want to become. Now, you're, you're becoming a... So what this does is it gives you a broad training view of a lot of, you know, so a lot of you know, training opportunities. So you'll be able to, you know, uh, assist initially in a gastrectomy. And then, okay, you decide, okay, I want to become an upper JS surgeon. Then the last two years are spent doing only gastrectomies and esophagectomies. So that's that's the most, you know, that, that's the beauty of this training. So your last five, your first four years are spent concentrating, you know, getting sort of general skills. So you, you know, I have done vascular anastomosis, you know, because I, I was uh, vascular, I did vascular for more than a year. So I've done femtopopular bypasses because my, my consumer is quite happy when we do them. So, it, you know, they all act to your skill. You may not know when you need them, but there might be a time when you might injure an artery or you might injure a vein and your vascular colleague or your hepatobiliary colleague may not be available for you to help you. Then you should be able to handle it. You cannot say, I don't know how to do it. I'm just, you know, let the patient suffer. So that is what the, the, this kind of training prepares you for. To move on, uh, so higher surgical training is quite concrete, like I told you. They also con they also concentrate on something called research and audit skills. Okay, that means why why should you concentrate on research and audit skills? Nowadays, most of what we try to do is should be evidence based. Yeah, obviously there'll be some you know some sort of areas where we cannot always use evidence, but most of our practice should be evidence based. And uh, for us to, you know, to practice uh, evidence-based, we should also be able to understand and evaluate the evidence. You know, suppose you read a paper, how do you know whether the paper is good? How do you know whether what the paper is, what is, you know, what is written about a particular topic, whether it's true, whether the results are, you know, what they have said or trans or achievable, and whether you can translate the results to your same practice. So how do you do that? For that, you need to understand, you know, basic research principles. So that, so that is a very important skill the higher surgical trainees in uh, the UK are expected to have. And you should also have a certain amount of contribution to teaching and learning of others. Uh, you know, the same, the same training happens in India. I know that as well. I know that research and audit skills happen, you know, but the only difference here is, you know, here, the, um, this is for even for you to get appointed, you need to demonstrate that. So that means, you need to have a research paper, not necessarily, you know, a, a very sort of uh, a paper in a very reputable journal, but even a small paper that shows that you have the necessary skills that you're able to, you know, uh, produce evidence-based research. And that if you're able to produce evidence-based research, it also means that you'll be able to, you know, your uh, is good or bad. So that, that's, that's what the reason behind you know, academic skills. So, uh, we, you want to, uh, Venus Kanagwell, do you want me to, you know, elaborate a bit more on the higher surgical training or carry on? Um, sir, I will be happy. Uh, see, I think you're going through a course of uh, hierarchical training. If a mm -hmm. surgeon in India who wants a yeah. mid-career level training. Okay, I, I, I will come to that a bit later in my topic. Yeah, I'll just tell you. Please go ahead. We can take questions at the end. Okay. Okay. Fine. So I, I just want to also talk about the international postgraduate uh, uh, deanery. The reason why I wanted to talk about the this is uh, you know exactly address what Doctor Will talk. You know because a lot of people India's India has expanded. You know India's Indian medical system has expanded. There are so many opportunities available. You know I was astounded when I came back here. Find that. Yeah, you know, people are doing everything that is being done in the UK, uh, and uh, you know, with actually good good results. You know, with good, excellent results, 
and uh, much cheaper compared to uh, what what is done in the uk now how do people get trained because not everyone wants to go and spend five or six years in the uk they just want to do one or two years you know they, or maybe just uh, three or four years and then come back here to india because there are so many opportunities now in available in india so this is where uh, the uh, uh, you know people like the royal college surgeons of Edinburgh can help so uh, there is something called the international postgraduate dean in at, at the royal college where you can apply for, you know, you can, have, so suppose you are a, you're a trainee and you want to do, uh, let's say, laparoscopic colorectal, you know, you are robotic colorectal and, uh, you know, you just want to uh, find out. Now, what can, what, what will happen is the, uh, the, uh, the International Postgraduate Dean at the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh can help you to achieve that. So, one, there, is, there are two training routes for that. One training route is where you know, uh, you have already uh, you already got a post, but you want to, to help of the royal want the help of the royal college to monitor your training. So that is you know that is one route. The other route is where is training route two. That means that you help tell the royal college, look, I'm looking for uh, posts. Uh, you know where I want to do some laparoscopic or directive work. So what they'll what the royal colleges do is basically contact trainers in the United Kingdom, and then you know. Uh, if they 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 want the trainees, then they will invite you to an interview. And if you're successful in the interview, your question will be confirmed. And also, you will be given some <coughs> support with the GMs, with the GMC and the visa applications. So basically, the international postgraduate dean facilitates uh, surgical trainees to get into post in the United Kingdom, where they'll be given a concentrated period of training for up to two years. And most likely, they will like, be expected to return back to India or whichever country of origin and practice as a specialist after that. So, uh, for them, for the uh, for people to apply to the international postgraduate uh, degree, you know there are some criteria. So, you should be resident outside the UK at the time of the application, and you should have you know uh, it's not necessary that you should have passed any exams, but you should have a medical. A qualification that is acceptable to the GMC for registration. Okay, and you cannot escape from the English language proficiency. That is something that they want us because basically the, the reason for that is there have been some, uh, you know, uh, East Europeans and uh, people who have not been able to unfortunately uh, proficient proficiency they have good proficiency in English and that has sort of resulted in poor communications with the patient. So just basically for patient communication, you have need to have an English proficiency and uh, uh, the other thing is you should be able to provide the GMC with a certificate of understanding and you should have been in clinical surgical practice so if you look at it there is actually no criteria which says that you need to pass either the MRCS or the FRCS exam so it is a good thing for people who you know really have you know, really done uh, some amount of training and were already in practice and really don't want to sit for an exam because they feel they don't need the additional qualification, but who just want training for one or two years. Uh, I also try to, you know, sort of uh, address what uh, uh, Dr. Tanavil is talking about. So what is the pathway for, you know, if you want to be an uh, aspiring uh, uh, surgeon? So if you're doing an MS and uh, if you are in the early part of your MS or if you're in your first year, then obviously, yes, you can sit for either the plan or the MRCS, or you can go for the international postgraduate dean training, whichever, the MS or your DNB. Or if you finished your MS and DNB and you're you know, more than three years, then I would say you would go, go better to go either for the MRCS or the international postgraduate dean training and avoid the PLAB. Because the PLAB is basically uh, an exam for, if you're a final year medical student, I'm sure most final year medical students in India would be able to pass the PLAB without any problems. Because the amount of training they do here, they'll pass the PLAB easily. Whereas once you've been, once you've done a certain amount of surgery, it'll be very difficult, for, not very difficult, you'll, you'll have to go, you'll have to read internal medicine, you'll have to read other subjects, which you may not, you know, may not necessarily need to, or like or need to do. Whereas if you are, you're, you know, a super specialist, and if you're training as a super specialist, we are doing either a MCH or a DNB in super speciality. Uh, <clears throat> again, you can do the MRCS. The MRCS exam, but remember that the MRCS exam is not just about general surgery. It may not be necessarily. So you may be uh, as someone who is in a DMB neurosurgery, and if you do the MRCS, you may you will be expected to answer general surgical questions. So either you can do the MRCS or more, uh, more, you know, or you can do the FRCS. Now at the minute, the FRCS international exam 
is run only for general surgery. And that is one of the reasons why I put MRCS in people who for even for trainees who are doing the MCH or DNB. So unfortunately, there, you know, the FRCS international exam for orthopedics, neurosurgery, or urology has not been brought into yet. Okay. So until that happens, so you'll have to either go through the MRCS route or through the international postgraduate DNB route. So these are the two routes that are available. But the common core is you will still have to do either the IITS or the OET in order to qualify for the English proficiency. Okay. Uh, if you're a core surgical training, so the doctor was just finished, then you can get into core surgical training. Uh, or, you know, if you want to do higher surgical training, then you can get into any level, that, uh, you know, either a MS, a DNB, or MCH. Or if you want to do a concentrated fellowship, again, you should have done some moment of surgical training. So there are some, uh, you know, MCH program that are run, uh, you know, uh, what to say, in combination with the, uh, with the, a lot of the NHS trusts. Now, the, the, uh, these are concentrated programs where you'll spend two years. Now, the course fees is about 35,000 pounds. So it is a little bit, uh, you know, uh, what to say, uh, expensive on initially, but then you'll be paid a salary. That means every month you will be working as a doctor, as a surgeon, uh, as either a surgical registrar or a surgical trainee <coughs> for two years, excuse me. And you will be placed in uh, placements in several hospitals across the United Kingdom. So it could be either an orthopedics, again, general surgery. So you will be getting a paid a salary, which will be in the region of around 3,000 pounds. Obviously, you can earn a little bit more within the hospital because, you know, if you are getting some extra work. But you'll be, you know, you will, you will be expected to pay a course fee. Now, the reason why they, why you are paying a course fee is because at the end of it, you are given a degree, which is an, which is an MCH, and the MCH can be in uh, whichever specialty of your choice. Okay. So the first year is mainly about clinical research. So you will be doing clinical research with a little bit of on-call work. So uh, uh, and then your second year will be mainly in your clinical work in the in the specialty of your choice. Okay. So I know people who have done uh, MCH in uh, surgical oncology. Now this this is not uh, so this is not completely like the surgical oncology training here because the surgical oncology training here is obviously <coughs> more quantitative and it's, more, it's for three years. But then that the, this surgical oncology training in, in the UK is basically uh, one year of research and one year of surgical training. And at the end of your one year of research, you're expected to publish a thesis and also present or publish the paper that you worked on in your thesis. So it does give you some opportunities. Uh, so I think that's the end of my session. And I'd be happy to do any questions from the moderators and uh, from the audience. Uh, and if I have not touched upon any topics that, uh, you know, people want to discuss about, I'd be more than happy to take questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Karthik. It was a very enlightening speech for uh, aspiring surgeons to get into the United Kingdom. But uh, you have also given the windows where uh, candidates can consider entering themselves into the surgical training very clearly. I have two quick questions uh, before we move to the audience questions. Uh, like, for instance, uh, you said very clearly IPD is one way of entry and going after a proper FRCS is one way of entry. Say, for instance, one of the uh, trained graduates or trained postgraduates in India, say, for instance, you were talking about the year six and seven training, people go into HPV rotation, upper GI rotation, vascular, of course, you said vascular is literally gone out of the mainstream. Yeah. But then, if somebody in India, say, for instance, a surgical gastroenterologist who aspires to fine tune his skills on liver transplantation, so he does not have a MRCS or a FRCS. So how difficult it is, I could understand IPD is one way of access to get in. Uh, it also needs some match, right, sir? You like we need to uh, get some acceptance because these people, many centers in India at this point of time do not have an active liver transplantation program. So when it comes to the match, they may not have any exposure in liver transplantation at all. And if the candidate is aspiring, what should be the right approach? This is one way of uh, putting the discussion on. And of course, many other domains are also little well advanced in the United Kingdom and more structured programs are happening there in the United Kingdom. What is the way to get into it? See, 
the international postgraduate dean degree depends upon uh, will will aim to uh, put you in that slot you know so if you want to get into lower transplant training the ipd will try to help you now um, that depends upon the job of availability at that time you understand because the jobs that are that the international postgraduate degree is trying to place trainees into are actually surgical training jobs okay so they they will they are fellowship jobs where you know uh, like i said competitive entry is already happened so suppose you know like if you look at kings you know they may have 10 you know uh, fellows who are do who want to do liver transplant okay and eight of the uh, posts may have already been occupied now what the uh, ipd can do is they'll try to inquire and find out if the two posts are free then whether the you know the the consultants say want to take on two more trainees and if they do say yes then obviously then what the, the ipd will do is facilitate that that means they will send the uh, trainee cv they will say you know to see whether they are suitable or whether it's appropriate for them to get into that training because you know you if you are going to spend concentrated training you want to make sure you get the right trainee as well because you know you're going to spend a lot of energy on training this person uh, and so it does but like i said this is depends upon the opportunities that are available in, this is like a free market you know it, it's unfortunately just like competition just like competition in india you know just like you know you're, you're right in the need uh, so it's a, it's a competition this is on a different scale that's it you know it's in a different domain not a scale different domain because you're not competing for an actual post but you you know you're not competing for an actual degree but you're competing for a training post so in case someone is not able to get into training in the ipd if they do their mrcs or their fasis what it does is it gives them more options so that means they are not restricted just to what the royal college of surgeons of edinburgh or the you know what the uh, like i told you the, the mch fellowships are able to offer it gives them broader opportunity they can apply they did not apply to kings they can apply to newcastle you know they can apply to liverpool they can apply to leeds because so again so it, it just like you know uh, like what uh, dr langa did went and did uh, liver transplant training in the us so to be able to uh, yes you you know you can try these avenues and but it depends upon like i told you what is the training slots that are available at that time because because these are all slots that are uh, a little outside the competitive zone we understand because they have already been competition from fellows you know the fellows may be uh, either surgeons who are already been trained in the uk and wanted to get two fellows from the uk itself or maybe overseas trainees who have done their mrcs so these two posts that are left are posts that are not been filled by them and so that's what you know the ipd and so that it, it's not it's something that cannot be guaranteed yes we will try and facilitate but it cannot be guaranteed So, I hope that answers your question. Very clear. That makes the things in the right perspective. People who have some aspirations or prefer to give an FRCS or an MRCS exam beforehand rather than going as a fresher for the NHS system for uh, getting into some form of training. No, uh, what it means is if you want to try the IPD, you can try it. By all means, try it. You know, if you are successful and if you're a little bit lucky, you will get into the training program of your choice. But in case you cannot. then you can maybe you can try for one or two years and then you decide okay fine you know i'm not able to so let me just you know get an get the exam and then see whether it opens up more opportunities for me to apply so because once you become eligible to you know to register with the gmc then the opportunities are more then you all that you need to do is go on the nhs jobs website and look for fellowships and keep applying you know and uh, the likelihood of you being able to get into a, a training fellowship is more as long as you apply for more number of jobs that's what happened to me you know because we you know initially i was not able to get into surgical training for a long time you know and i kept on applying uh, and then eventually i made it so unfortunately sometimes it is a, a long process there are people who are lucky so it's very difficult for us to say who will be able to get into it so that's the thing uh dr kartik now moving on to little basic uh, training programs say a fresher who has just come out of the mbbs after their internship 
say i could recall my days where we were uh, preparing for the plap examination along with our neat now current neat those days it was all india pg exam so what happens is many people i still know have traveled to east ham or somewhere in uk where our support systems like amc house stanley house or madras medical college house were existent uh, is do you still advise those type of moving in there going to the uk and start preparing for the plab or mrcs is worthwhile because it looks very clear anyone in from india can also give these exams in india what is your advice on this uh, aspect uh, i of, uh, i can i i, I guided a trainee uh, but she is doing pediatrics okay and uh, you know i i am very happy about that because she you know she was a duty doctor working in new york and she came and asked me about the plab and uh, she did apply ilts and the plab one in chennai and then went to plab two for the uk and actually now training jobs in the uk are you know are open because there is so much opportunity now in the uk because people just want to take on training she got a training uh, job within a six months of landing there yes that's a bit lucky but still you know so i would say if you if you uh, the only thing is and previously it used to be that if you did your uh, training only based in the uk as a surgeon it's a bit difficult for you to come and practice here but now that's not the case because the mrcs and the fcs are recognized by the indian medical indian medical council and also by the tamil nadu medical council so you can actually register your degree and work uh, and that's one of the reasons why i did an ms because i always wanted to come back and work in, in india in surgery because you know even though i trained in the uk i always felt that i wanted to come back and work here whether forever or for some time but i want to work here so uh, if you are uh, you know if you want to do your uh, if you are just finish your mbbs i would still say it's a good choice because uh, not only you get uh, you will also be uh, paid a decent salary to start with and uh, then you also have the option because now obviously it was that uh, once you train in the uk you have to become a consultant in the uk now it's not like that you want you can come back to india or you can you know work in singapore for two or three years and then come back to india uh, and uh, you can come back and work either in the corporate sector or you know whichever place you want to so uh, i'll still say it's a good option uh, then we move on to a little bit more into the training part uh, considering the course as you have been mentioning on various specialties uh, after mbbs um i've uh, noted some posts are training intensive posts there they go for an rcs rotation and some are stand alone posts people sometimes if they do not get a proper training rotation of 18 months or 24 months they end up working in a district hospital for a short term 6 month uh, career in general surgery or field of their own interest uh, will that way going to a non training post for a brief period will be detrimental in getting into a structured program right. so that the point is very clear do, do they get into the structured program up front or are they fine to work so that they gain some united kingdom experience so that when they go for a competitive positions will that make any benefit that, that's that's a very good question but i remember that's what i was telling you about the higher surgery training criteria you know that's why i specifically mentioned that because they have mentioned that you should not have desirable criteria not to have more than 72 months of you know so if you are someone who's done your ms and work for one or two years here and then you go there and then you find it you know i could not i was not for four years i was not able to find it to get into a training program you know and i had to work like do stand alone jobs like it did but then during those four years what it did was i tried to strengthen my cv you know i tried to make sure that i my cv was getting better and better so that when the time came when i applied you know i uh, i was ready for it i was ready to get into surgery higher surgery training and then make sure that they were not able to say no you know the good thing about the uk is once you meet the essential criteria and then you meet also the desirable criteria and you perform an interview they will not be able to uh, you know say no to you that means they not be able to say no you cannot be a post but again the this is competitive so you really need to perform well like uh, you know i i did my research Uh, and uh, but during that time i was fortunate because you know my my uh, uh, research supervisor was a laparoscopic orthopedic surgeon and he taught me you know all endoscopy and i learned all the basics of laparoscopy so even before i went to general surgery training 
I was able to, you know, do colonoscopy, endoscopy by myself. I used, was able to do diagnostic laparoscopy. So it all depends upon also how much enthusiasm the training shows. So if you're someone who's willing to go the extra mile, then your consultant, most consultants will be willing to do that. There'll be very few consultants who will say, oh, you know, I don't care. Uh, that kind of attitude is very less in the UK, you know. Uh, so I, we, should not be, we should not become disheartened, you know. There are some questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, sir, I will go one after the other. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. Sir, are you with us? I think he has some internet issues. Yeah. But awesome. The, the pace of the discussion is very, very good. Thank you, Dr. Ilingo. I think, uh, Ilingo, before Karthik joins, and I would like to have a, ask a quick question mm -hmm. to you also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know that you went after MCH for a solid organ transplant training for the United States. Uh, is there a way uh, like the United States can accept us without a US MLE? Because that has always been the question by us. Non-MLE fellowships, how difficult it is or how one can apply for a non-MLE fellowship? Can you throw us some light on that, sir? So um, for... Uh... In US, you need USMLE to be a surgeon. There is no other way. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, very, very particular. I think uh, we can take that discussion on uh, one more of the LLS sessions. Okay. And I will find people who have gone from India after their general surgical training and how they did their surgical residency can be a good, um, a good eye opener for students here. But as far as good surgical training is required, is concerned, USMLE is a must. Without USMLE, you cannot touch the patient. Observership also will not allow you to touch the patient. The only time you can go to US and work in a hospital and touch patients and do clinical work is when you have not finished your MBBS. You can go as an extern and there, there will, some professor will accept you and then you can work on the clinical side. But apart from that, only observerships are available. So US is a very different uh, goal. You need the USMLE. What I have learned is that USMLE is far more easier examination than what many people think. And about that, we'll go. Karthik is back, actually. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no worries. I know it's I gracious. Uh, sir, we will go to the questions in the chat box. Uh, one, Dr. Mayank has asked us, uh, thank you, sir, for the talk. And uh, as you said, uh, the current FRC is suspended. Uh, I, I, it apparently looks that he has done his DNB neurosurgery and has completed the course. Sir, is there a possibility in any institutes in the United Kingdom uh, can employ me? Uh, I think apparently he has not done GMC eligibility or FRCS. That's the way if he has gone in. What is the way to get into the United Kingdom system? So he, he can apply through the IPD. So he has to, uh, you know, he has to basically apply through the IPD. You know, uh, there is a, the, he just needs to go to the RCS Edinburgh website and there is a separate IPD office uh, and actually, uh, one of the uh, uh, who's now the vice president is uh, Mr. Paula Rajesh. He is he is from Chennai, and he was instrumental in setting it up. And uh, uh, basically, after that, he has to contact them, and they'll help him out. So that's what he needs to do. Right, um, sir. The next question, moving on to, is from one Dr. Anand. Uh, sir, uh, thanks for your talk. How difficult it is to get in uh, non-training? Say he wants to know whether he can get into a non-training post in neurology at ST3 level. And if it is possible, can you please help us how the selection process is done, sir? See, if you want to get into a non-training post, uh, you will have to pass one of the exams. That The reason you have to pass one of the exams is because you need to be eligible to you know, register with the GMC. So you need to pass either the MRCS or the FRCS. I would say uh, probably a bit easier to go for the MRCS and you have to pass your in English exam. And non-training jobs are, uh, uh, you know, quite uh, are a bit more easier to get than training jobs because uh, they are more plentiful. And uh, the non-training job does not mean that you will not get any training. I was in a non-training job for more than four to five years before I got into training. So it is not like you, that does not, it, again, like I told you, it all depends upon the level of enthusiasm that you show. So if you say to the consultant, yes, teach me colonoscopy, most people will teach you. You know, they may not let you do each and every colonoscopy that comes to the door. 
but they'll let you do one or two, which is enough. And over a period of time, if you improve your skills and show them that you're able to do it, you, you know, they will let you do it. So because work, there's no dearth of work in the NHS. And the NHS, you know, they just want good doctors who will be able to treat patients safely. So you will be able to get into it. Fine, sir. Then I'm not sure the person does not identify himself. Sir, he wants to know what's your take on MTI, sir. Uh, will it be useful yeah. or it's like an observership? Uh, again, the medical training initiative, that's an MTI is a medical training initiative. Uh, again, it depends upon, it's not an observership. It depends upon the post that you get. Okay. Uh, so, depending upon the post that you uh, uh, get in a particular hospital. So, if you are get a good post where there is good amount of training going on, yes, it will, you know, it will be. But uh, uh, the uh, that again depends upon that. So, that is there is some groundwork you will have to you will have to contact the hospital. You have to try and speak to the fellows who are already there. You know, to because if you are someone. Who wants to get a lot of training then that's what you need to do so you have to go you have to do some you have to have some initiative being a surgeon become means that you need to have initiative i've not seen any surgeon who does not have initiative you know at least any good surgeon who does not have initiative so for you know nothing can be spoon fed to you you will have to show some initiative you let to contact the hospital you let to contact the consultants a lot of nhs consultants are quite happy uh, if you contact them at a particular time they will spend some time with you you know, now, especially because now that, you know, uh, uh, like Zoom is available, they will even talk to you. They'll tell you, they'll tell you straight to your face what you will expect to get when you go for that job. Okay. And uh, most people will be very honest with you. And then you decide whether this job is, you know, for you or not. So try to, you know, have some initiative, contact the trainer, contact the trainees that are already there, speak to them, find out what they, you know, whether they achieved their goals, what they wanted before they started. So things like that. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Samir. Sir, he would like to know about the CESR route to get into the CCT program. Yeah. Sir, uh, he also uh, wants to know if he has uh, spent a lot of years after MBBS out of the United Kingdom. Will getting a CCT post will be a more challenging when compared to a fresher applying for a CCT post? These are the I, I, Okay, I presume he's talking about uh, surgical training. Uh, because CSR route is basically uh, an alternative to a CCT. That means that you have to show competencies uh, that are, you know, that are suitable for a first year consultant. That means you should be able to do, uh, uh, you know, either a complex laparotomy without assistance, you know, a complex laparoscopic cholecystectomy without assistance, or, you know, and you should be able to manage, you know, uh, emergency situations uh, uh, safely. And you should also be able to do basic procedures in the subspecialty of your choice. So if you are a hepatobiliary surgeon, you should be able to, you know, you should be able to do a ripple. You know, there is no, uh, so you will have to demonstrate that you are able to do a ripple. And that demonstration means just not you saying it, you know, any surgeon can say, I will be able to do a ripple. No, it does not mean that. It means your trainer has to show documentary evidence or, you know, or one of your trainers, or maybe two of your trainers has to, you know, vouch for it. So the CSR route is achievable, but it is a bit more easier for people who have worked in the United Kingdom for some, ex some you know, some extent, because that way, because the set of competencies and the set of forms that they ask, you know, they because the forms, that they, they are, there's a lot of training forms that are available, and those training forms have to be filled in. So the difficulty with the, uh, most of us is we have to go and backdate them. So, you know, if you've done your MS or your MCH about 10 years ago, for you to go in and able to fill in those competencies from the uh, trainers who taught you is a difficult thing. It is, you know, it's not insurmountable, but it, it, it uh, again, you need a lot of personal initiative to do that. You know, you need to, you need to uh, fulfill all the criteria for it. Once you fulfill the criteria, they will, yes, they will take you in. So that is the thing. Thank you, sir. And uh, one more question from Ranjit. I think uh, that will be a separate discussion on USMLE as Dr. Uh, probably Dr. Elango can answer that. No, at this point, I think when uh, I think LGS is planning for a separate uh, US entry pla uh, platform separately. Uh -huh. So we move on to the next question. This is from Dr. Raghunath Raja. Uh, sir, uh, I think he has done his MSH in J surgery. 
and he has uh, cleared MRCS Part B. Uh, sir, what is the pathway so that we move on to become a consultant in GI surgery there in the United Kingdom? In the United Kingdom. Okay. So for that, you'll have to get into higher surgical training. So even if you don't have an MCH, you'll have to either get into higher surgical training because at the end of it, you'll be, you'll be given what is called a CCT because the GMC is the body that awards you the CCT. Only if once you're given the CT, CCT, you're eligible to work as a consultant in the United Kingdom. Or you should get what is called the CSR, which the previous person was talking about. Okay. So if you're able to show with your MCH and your MS or your DNB training that you have achieved the competencies that are necessary for you to work as a first, you know, first day consultant in the UK, then you can become a consultant. Or once, because you've done your MRCS, you have cleared your, uh, uh, you know, you now you're eligible to register with the GMC, you'll be able to, you know, apply for the HST, the Higher Surgical Training Program. And you go through the Higher Surgical Training Program. I you know, I would still say it's advantageous because, you know, uh, yes, maybe after an MCH, you may, you know, you may not be wanting to do lap up and disectomies, but then you may want to do two years of concentrated training in your subspecialty of your choice. So it will still be useful. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, before I wind up, I have two uh, questions from my side. Uh, sir, there has been recently that MSREA program, which has been created by the MHS, the multi-speciality recruitment program. But I went, mm -hmm. went through that. Apparently, general surgery and core surgical training does not seem to be part of it. Uh, like, uh, is sort of a, it looks like it's a nationalized entry so that candidate can apply in one track and they be available for most of the positions which are uh, thrown up for uh, vacancies. Um, can you throw us some lights, sir? Where do we stand in uh, MSRA exam as such? I, I think that, uh, that unfortunately that depends upon demand and supply. See, general surgery is quite a, a popular training program. Okay. And uh, some of the training programs at the minute are not able to fill their places from the uh, UK population of uh, uh, doctors and medical students. So that is why this has been you know, put in place because they want people to apply and they, they, if they find eligible candidates, they'll be able to appoint them. So it gives them, a, but gen, the reason why general surgery has still not been introduced into it because they have sufficient number of applications, number of applicants. So they don't feel the need to introduce, to include the general surgical program into this. That is why it's not there. Uh, Sir, so next one more question. It looks like uh, when I went through the RCS uh, HHE program and other things, it looks like uh, someone who is getting into after an MBBS, it takes at least 11 years or 12 years to come out with the CCST certification. Uh, Jen, uh, am I right? No, because your core training is for two years. Okay. Okay. And then after your core training, you have you do ST training. It starts from ST1 and goes on up to ST8. So, or, yeah, almost, you know, if you do a couple of fellowships, you'll be doing 11 to 12 years. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. the question is, um, if you are going to have an MCH training, uh, say, for instance, MCH in GA surgery or MCH in surgical oncology, uh, do we get exemptions in these number of years of uh, training program? Uh, because we have spent five years or six yeah. years of uh, intensive training in India. Uh, this is a common thing because are we to get aligned to another eight years of full training or do we have some exemptions, sir? Can That's you close point? Some issue with this internet. I understand. Okay, we'll allow him to come in. Uh, Elango, sir, I would like to ask a quick question. Of course, very yeah. basic. For a young MBBS graduate to get into a UK exam fee if, or if exam. You're, if you're an MCH, sorry, to answer your question. Okay. If you if you're a, a, a you know MCH trainee, they will not appoint you into ST one. They will appoint you either at the level of ST three, or at the level of you know you, yes you can get exemption because when I was a trainee they they offered me an exemption because I done my MS. They said you can count a year, and especially if you've done a year of research again they count that as well. So you can get exemption, but I actually didn't take it. The reason why I didn't take it was. Uh, because I, I was quite happy, you know, I was quite happy for some time not to have the responsibility of being a consultant. You know, it's actually good being a registrar for some time, you know, because you can operate, but then the responsibility is not on you. 
because you don't actually take ultimate responsibility for the patient if you know what i mean that is that is the basic advantage of being a trainee you know and in, and in addition you can see a lot of things people do things so differently you know uh, just doing a, you know right hemicorrectomy someone does it in a very different way compared to someone else and it's beautiful to watch you know it's it's very good to watch see other surgeons operate uh, because like for me now i've been operating independently for almost you know 12 years or so and you know i really i am not i don't see anyone else operate apart from myself maybe if i pop my head and i i don't see anyone else doing anything you know and sometimes we think that all of us are you know doing the right thing sometimes we may doing some something wrong which you know which actually uh, really helps so it all depends on your mindset if you decided uh, you yeah i you know i have done enough training i don't want any more yes they will give you an exemption but they will also tell you you know they the only problem with getting an exemption is at the end of st8 you should be able to demonstrate the competencies if we get an exemption and then at the end of st8 say you're not able to do a whipple being a hepatobiliary surgeon then they'll make you retrain they'll say fine you know you're done enough but you're not you're not ready for it sorry mate you got to go back you got to go back and do a year come back and tell me that you're you know your trainer should be ready to sign you off to do a whipple then only they will train you so like when i was about to be awarded my cct i had six consultants that my last meeting was about with six consultants and another two you know uh, the trainers then only they signed me off because they discussed everything they asked me for oh, are you able to do an anti resection will be able to do an gastrectomy then only and they looked at all my trainers report then only they signed me off so uh, whether you if you if you're that confident you know if you're already confident oh i can do a whipple you know i don't need the training then yes you know you can get an exemption but not for a long time maybe for a year or two years uh thank you very much sir a uh, bit of touchy question but then it has to be asked uh, for a beginner after an mbbs uh, to get all these exams done to get traveling to the united kingdom till they get the first placement you very carefully mentioned handsome salary on training time but then they need to have some finances ready so what should be the amount of money one should be prepared to spend till they get a first uh, official rotation post or a stand alone post sir? or a fresher from mbbs yeah uh, are you asking me about including the cost of the exams and everything right. the principally the exam fee to get the first job uh, i would say you'd be a, you you'd spend at least 3 to 4 lakhs that's you know, and that if you live on a shoestring budget okay and then uh, uh, maybe this is too a raw question but then if they are spending about 3 to 4 lakhs on getting into it uh, how well they'll be able to sustain themselves sir how much money they need to have per month for sustaining the united kingdom till they get into the position of uh, getting a placement uh, you mean after getting the placement or before before and sir once they get a placement i am sure they are going to draw some yeah. stuff before getting the placement you uh... <laughs> i would say they will need, they will they will need to spend at least you know 300 to 400 pounds a month that's fair very fair mm -hmm. uh thank you very much sir i think we have one or two questions yeah. before we wind up um uh, there is one person who has written sir thanks for your inputs what's the standpoint of mrcs in singapore malaysia and in the gulf countries will it be helpful for job opportunities this is again someone from motorola or some uh, maybe he wants to know about the middle east and uh, eastern opportunities yeah it, it it will be helpful it will, you know uh, the mrcs may not take you to a consultant level but still it will give you a bit more of a negotiating you know aspect uh, compared to just uh, an indian degree i'm not belittling the indian degrees in any way but uh, unfortunately this is how the system works in the gulf yeah can, can i ask one question which yeah. i think um, suppose um, there is a consultant in the in the late 40s and who has finished mch and stuff like that or is a senior surgeon who wants to have specific training on a particular thing like bariatric surgery for a short time about a year or he wants to do research in some advanced works um, in say pancreas or in 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 transplantation or in kidney transplantation uh, is there an opportunity for people like that to go i know there are there are some people who go to france for a short visit six months one year and how are those opportunities for senior surgeons 
uh, for specific training opportunities yeah. in if, UK. If you, if you want to operate, if you want to operate, you need to have a GMC registration. Okay, whether the GMC registration is got through the International Postgraduate Deanery or whether it's got through a qualifying exam, uh, it does not matter. But as long as the GMC says, okay, this doctor is suitable to practice in the United Kingdom, then the trust will let you, you know, will let you operate. So opportunity, yes, opportunities are available. But again, you know, so this depends upon, like I told you, what are the opportunities available at that time? One, to expand the number of opportunities that are available, it is a little bit better to do the exam. So if you do the exam, just expand the amount of opportunities that will be available. And uh, thank you, sir. And one last question before we wind up from Dr. Ranjit Singh. Sir, after MCH, if CCT is clear, can one become a consultant directly in the United Kingdom? Is that a possibility? Yeah, if you do your CCT, if you do get a CCT, Yes, then you are eligible to apply for consultant jobs. Again, it is a competitive interview process. It does not mean automatically if you get a CCT, you'll be given a consultant post. There will be other people with the CCT will be competing for the same post. And you got to prove to the uh, you know trust that you are capable of working as a consultant. So you have to, again, it's competitive. Uh, before we wind up, uh, sir, if somebody wants to know, you have been very kind in telling even the consultants from the United Kingdom is uh, willing to spend some time educating and uh, analyzing assessment uh, and evaluate of how and where he can fit in. If any candidate from our country would like to have a quick uh, discussion with you, how do they reach you? Uh, actually, I forgot to put my email address, but uh, I'll put it on the you know, chat box. So if people want to contact me, please email me. I'll be more than happy to help. So for gentlemen who are not in the uh, Zoom, it is going to be M Karthik. Uh, M, M for Monday, M Karthik, K-A-R-T-H-I-K, 1272 numerals at gmail.com. I will repeat again, M Karthik, K-A-R-T-H-I-K, 1272 at gmail.com. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, interacting with you, Dr. Karthik. I'm sure it uh, gives a lot of uh, input to a uh, fresher, a mid-level surgeon or a career surgeon to find a path into the United Kingdom, uh, United Kingdom training programs. And in fact, it's a lot of uh, learning from our side also. Thank you, Dr. Ilango, and thank you, Dr. Radhakshna, for inviting me to be part of this. I think Dr. Radhakshna is waiting to give the closing comments. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's been a very thorough and uh, a very systematic uh, discussion, and I think there are no questions uh, left unanswered. And it, I'm sure it's, it's much useful for the youngsters who are uh, keen to move to the UK for training, advanced training. I have uh, one uh, point to make with Dr. Karthik is when we were, uh, when I was an undergraduate and uh, subsequently postgraduate, there was a huge uh, craze for um, lab. You know, all my classmates were moving towards plan, but you know, just a few years down the line, they have turned the site to the USML and they started going in hordes to USML. And uh, after a while, I didn't know. Uh, I could uh, guess that uh, the craze for um, uh, plan has come down a little bit over the years. Uh, and, but then after, with the Brexit again, there is some uh, yes, sir. positive uh, movement. I mean, what is it like? Because there are times when I said, okay, UK is closed for Indians. Yes, sir. It, it Again, it all depends upon the market opportunities. You know, they 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 just, if they need people, they will take you. Okay. They, they will go at any lengths to take you if they need people. But if the need, if the demand comes down, then the market becomes more competitive. Then you have to place yourself at an advantage compared with others. So uh, uh, the uh, one of the reasons why a lot of us didn't do the MLE was surgical training is almost impossible to get into the US. You know, yes, you can do fellowships there, but getting to, getting into training is much more. more difficult I think than I think the uh, roles are actually reversed. If you follow the American College of Surgeons, uh, the educational websites, and uh, knowing the ground realities it is not impossible to get a surgical training post in the US now. Now, yes, things have improved in the US. Previously, you know, at least for my generation, 
it was it was very difficult so you know, it was you cannot it was very difficult uh, the uk is also the You know, today, I, I, today I, I, they are actually welcoming surgeons because there are not lots of people who are willing to take up surgery. It is uh, five or seven years of hard work. The the yeah. day actually starts at four a.m. for the yeah, resident. Yeah, it's, it's very hard. Terrible, so actually. So no hard. American wants to do it unless they yeah. are really committed to surgery. So you have surgical openings See, here. You, you, yeah, UK but as well is very hard. I went for. I will be very honest with you. I went for about seven, eight interviews before I got my. training job and to be told no at each interview hits you you know you just think oh my god is that it you know that's it is it the end of your surgical career because that's all it that's all i thought about for that time i never thought about making money i never all that i wanted to do was become a surgical trainee so if you want to train either in the uk or in the us or in india as a surgeon you really need to have that you know uh, you need to put in that effort you can't just have it easy you need to put in that effort effort have that commitment and then say and you know just have a never say die attitude i will not stop until i get into training only then you will be able to get into it you know uh, yes it is difficult for us at some point but uh, you know you maybe you know maybe we have reached a stage of that sometimes you become a bit older and decide that's not what i want to do then that's fine but when you're younger uh, you have no other choice especially in surgery so i had a lot of seniors who first went to the uk did their fellowship then moved to us is it yes, easier to move to us that yeah. way with the nigger yeah, that that is a bit easier sir that is a bit easier uh, that, that is because unfortunately you know the us and the uk still uh, consider their training to be much more superior compared to uh, uh, you know not the rest of asia but you know a lot of people a lot of people you know a lot of uh, places in asia uh, that is a perception uh, which has been difficult to uh, sort of um, what to say change so uh, that is the problem unfortunately we don't have any common exams previously you know my one of my consultants used to tell me that the ms for the ms people you come you english examiners used to come and uh, you know examine in the ms that's what happens in sri lanka you used to happen in sri lanka you know for your uh, final year second part of your ms when you uh, passed your ms you are automatically give you are automatically passed the pass is first part so you just had to sit the second part you know that is because english examiners used to come to sri lanka to examine uh, ms candidates but uh, uh, you know that that was stopped by the indian medical council or the you know so if you had something uh, some similar program then that might have translated into it but because of that it has been stopped yeah i think we can revive that <laughs> <laughs> thanks uh, kartik it is so thank you sir very much a pleasure uh, in, i think in some of the following sessions we'll hear about training in the us from uh, ilango when when ilango talks about that he'll be he sounds very passionate about uh, his stay in the us and i think it, the, the, today's talk has must have been for quite a few instances and i'm sure you are open uh, to any uh, help and i'm sure I, i'm more than happy to help people as much as they can so you put on your uh, email id sure. uh, wonderful and uh, uh, ilava and uh, um, we'll have yet another uh, session with uh, kartik and at another day yeah in the, in the coming not operating emergencies that is <laughs> apologize for the you know poor wifi connection but uh, sorry about that <laughs> pleasure Thank, yeah, you. Just, Thank, okay. thanks, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We'll meet again next week with another session on LLS. Since then, till then, bye bye. 